Hello, everybody, and welcome to your poem of the day. And this poem is called London by a really, really famous uh, English romantic poet called William Blake. So let's get started then. Um, a reminder how to study a poem at home. Make sure you annotate the poem. Make sure you have notes on context, language and structure. We'll go through those in this presentation. Make sure that you also read the poem on your own before watching the analysis. Now, if you can see it down there, if you don't have an anthology at home, print out a copy or create a list of notes. But even better would be to write the poem out in full and then annotate it. It's really important you get those annotations. You're going to need them. So let's begin. I'd like you to have a quick think about this question. What comes to mind when you think of the city of London? Pause the video for a moment and write down the first three words that come to mind. Right. I imagine that you wrote things along along the lines of capital city. You might have said things like money. You might have mentioned some of the, the tall and imposing buildings. You might have mentioned the government. Um, however, you might have mentioned things like poverty or even crime, things that we associate with a, with a big city. Now, before we start looking at the poem, I'd like to take you back uh, several centuries ago. And London is a relatively modern city. It, um, its growth has happened over the last 200 years or so. And much of London, much of the outskirts of London now, 200 years ago would have been like this, would have been fields, fields of green. OK, pleasant countryside. Yet through the process of urbanisation and industrialization, i.e. Uh, business and manufacturing was moving to London and uh, many people were moving in um, from the countryside to live urban lives. London became this. OK, and this is kind of early Victorian times um, prior to the, the writing of uh, A Christmas Carol or around about the time of the writing of A Christmas Carol. So London became a place of slums, of urban, urban overcrowding, of illness, um, of crime. Um, and so those pleasant fields were built upon and London became, um, for better or worse, the city it is today. Let's have a quick look at the population of London. Now, around about 1801, which was uh, just after William Blake wrote the poem London, uh, London's population was at a million. Now have a look at it. Right. Uh, we're up to, you know, nine million. It's one of the largest cities in Europe, if not the world. So let's start having a look at the context then of the poem London. So William Blake, the poet, um, he lived in London himself, rather like Charles Dickens, and was appalled by the world that he witnessed. And like Dickens, he would walk the streets of London um, in despair at some of the, the some of the things that he was seeing, um, the people and the mood and the atmosphere of the city. The poem was published in 1794. Um, this is about 50 years prior to uh, A Christmas Carol. And again, like Christmas Carol, it was a time of poverty, of child labour, of prostitution and huge industrial change. There was also a fear that the French Revolution might repeat itself in London. Now, the French Revolution occurred in 1789 in France. And to cut a long story short, uh, the people overthrew the monarchy. And as a result, um, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And the fear was that if the government and those in power um, were not, did not treat um, the ordinary people well, and give them the freedoms that they deserve, that perhaps the French Revolution might repeat itself in London. And so in 1794, the French Revolution would have been fresh in the memory of Blake and his readers. Um, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, 
you know, it covers many of the same ideas as A Christmas Carol. So, Blake, Blake wrote um, a, a, two volumes of poems, Songs of Innocence and of Experience. And so London comes from Songs of Innocence and Experience, written by Blake in the 1790s. In the Songs of Innocence that was published first, um, the poems are positive in tone and they celebrate love, childhood and nature. However, the poem London is taken from the Songs of Experience. And this second set of poems provide a stark contrast to those in Songs of Innocence. And they illustrate the effects of modern life on people and nature. So the Songs of Innocence um, were positive in tone, whereas the Songs of Experience were much more negative and pessimistic. And so, as I've mentioned already, let's just move my face out the way there. There we go. Um, the London that, that, that Blake describes in this poem is one of appalling industrial conditions, child labour, prostitution and poverty, and a number of other things as well, which we'll come to in a moment. So, I'm going to begin by reading the poem. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, a mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. If this is the first time you've heard it, May I suggest that you read the poem through once more? OK, we're going to go through it slowly now, um, looking closely at two things. So what's actually happening, what it what it means, um, but also uh, beginning to analyse the language. And it's important at this point that you are taking down annotations. I will write a few three things on the screen, but there will be other things that I say out loud and I suggest that you write down anything that you think might be useful. OK, then let's begin. So, so starting with the first stanza. I wander through each chartered street. OK. Um, now, let's start with, with the word wander. Uh, if you wander, um, you walk without a purpose, you're, you're aimless. Um, and this is uh, a literal description of what Blake himself was doing in London, walking aimlessly through the streets. But it also gives us a sense of his despair, his lack of hope of what he can see. He, he, he can't bring himself to walk with any sort of, um, sense of sense of meaning with a destination. And then twice in these two lines. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. Twice we see a repetition of this word chartered. Now, if something is, is chartered, it means that it is owned. Um, it's mapped out and owned. And in London, this would be a reference to the way that the streets and even the Thames itself was was owned, was the property of the powerful and the rich. Note the second uh, use of the word chartered with Thames. Um, when you think of the Thames, you think of this huge, great flowing um, uh, river, um, this, this natural force. Yet what, what, what Blake is showing as a romantic poet is that the Thames um, has been taken, has been stolen from nature um, and is now owned by society. Uh, the repetition that we see here with Chartered, um, you still see repetition all the way through the poem. And this is 
Blake's way, really, of showing the the overwhelming sort of endlessness of uh, of the city that he lives in, the way that everything is exactly the same. Um, nothing has its own individual personality anymore. Moving on to the next two lines, you'll notice again the repetition and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So three times we see the word mark there. In the first example, mark is being used as an old fashioned way of saying see or notice. So he notices in every face marks of weakness, marks of woe. And the second mark, I would think, is is in terms of um, it, it's, it's like a scar, I would say. The people are weak and they're full of woe. In other words, it kind of extreme, overwhelming sadness. So we're getting a sense of both their physical with weakness and their emotional with woe um, feelings. Let's just move my face up here to get me out of the way. So there we go. The repetition highlights the overwhelming nature of the moral and physical corruption. They're branded with suffering. Um, animals are branded. Um, traditionally, you would brand an animal by sort of burning a mark onto its back, like a like a cow, um, to show um, you know, show who owns that cow. Um, and I get the sense that the people here are sort of branded with these uh, marks, these 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 marks that you cannot get off. Um, let's move on. So in the next uh, stanza, in every cry of every man, um, think of men, supposedly brave and courageous, stereotypically. But here they're crying, crying probably in fear and, and sadness, um, that masculinity stripped away in every infant's cry of fear. OK. An infant should not be crying in fear. An infant should be protected and looked after by uh, the adults in its life and the society um, that it comes from. But here we see one of the forms of corruption that their childhood is corrupted. It's it's been being destroyed uh, by the situation these people are in in London. Um, in every voice, in every ban. You'll notice that the word every is repeated four times in that stanza. And indeed, we see it once more in the previous stanza um, and the word each there as well, which is very similar. And again, it's that notion of the overwhelming um, uh, sameness um, of, of the world that um, that Blake is walking through. He cannot escape the fact that everybody's freedom is being crushed. Um, let's have a look. In every voice, in every band, the mind forge manacles I hear. Now, this is the most important line in the poem, this last one, the mind forged manacles I hear. This is a metaphor, and it's a metaphor for the psychological imprisonment of the citizens of London. So, manacles, make sure you write this down, manacles are like handcuffs. Um, if you forge something, you make it um, usually out of out of metal. And of course, this poem took place during the Industrial Revolution, where people were using steel and iron um, to recreate the world and to manufacture all sorts of goods um, and equipment and technology that, that was never they were never able to do so before. So there's a bit of a sort of irony that he's used the word forged here. But the key thing is the word mind. These people are forced by society to imprison themselves in their own minds. OK, and so this whole poem is about this idea of entrapment. All of these people trapped into London, trapped into this society they cannot escape from. Let's move on. How the chimney sweepers cry. Now, the reference to the chimney sweepers and again that repetition of the word cry um, chimney sweepers would have been children because only children would have been small enough to get inside the chimneys so uh, this is a, a reference to the child labor um, that again was corrupting society in um, in Blake's lifetime in the next line we have another of the important quotations every blackening church appalls so he's appalled by the church 
Notice the way that the church is placed next to the word blackening, that adjective. And this is a really interesting juxtaposition because this is quite ironic. The church should be bringing light and hope. Yet it's not. It's bringing blackness. Now, in this sense, it's about the the, the notion that um, the the the, the darkness is a, is a symbol for evil. And so the church that should be bringing hope is perhaps bringing evil. Perhaps there's also a reference there to the soot and the grime that would have literally covered the churches of industrial London. Um, but here, Blake is pointing the blame at the situation London finds itself at to the church. And in Blake's lifetime, the church was one of the most most powerful institutions um, in the country. Um, and here we see this idea of spiritual goodness becoming corrupted. The church is corrupted. It's doing evil things. Then we see quite a complicated idea in the next two lines. And the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. Um, and so you've got this idea, this image of the palace walls with the soldier's blood running down it. Um, but it's their sighs, um, the sounds that are coming from their mouths that seem to be running in blood. So what's all this about? Well, the word hapless means unlucky. Um, and it seems that their blood is marking the palace walls. Um, almost as if the palace, i.e. the monarchy, so the kings and queens of the time, are being um, are being blamed um, for the soldier's death. So maybe this is a reference to the way that, that, that the monarchy mistreats soldiers and armies. I also think that underneath here is probably a subtle reference to the French Revolution, because, of course, the French Revolution brought bloodshed right to the palace walls. And here Blake is hoping to evoke um, fear in his readers, fear that um, that London will suffer the same fate as Paris and other French cities. I've underlined there, as you can see, um, the S sounds here. Blake makes real use of uh, what we call sibilance here. And sibilance is the repeated S sound, creating, I think, quite a sort of a, a sinister and possibly um, uh, frustrated feel to these lines. But last of all, let's have a look at the last stanza. But most through midnight streets I hear. So note the word midnight here. Uh, reference again to the darkness and the evil, which seems to overwhelm and flood the city through day and night. I hear how the youthful, oh, I missed that one there. Sorry. How the youthful harlots curse. So a harlot is an old fashioned word for a prostitute. But note the way that the, the adjective um, youthful has been used to describe um, the harlot. And of course, um, that was uh, Blake's way of sort of trying to shock us as the reader, because, um, you know, these are children um, who are being forced into the worst profession you can imagine. Um, and once again, it's about the corruption of childhood. Now, this last image is quite complicated. The youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. OK, so the harlots are cursing, they're swearing. And this blasts, think of that verb blasts. It's, it's a huge, a huge and uh, quite aggressive and overpowering sound. Um, Yet this sound blasts the newborn infant's tear. So the first thing that these newborn infants hear at birth, at the moment there, they shed a tear, which of course, as we know, happens at the moment of birth. The first thing they hear is the curse. So they are corrupted right from the moment of birth. But the curse also blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Now, this has a double meaning. 
if you blight something, you make it sick, you make it ill. And a blight is is kind of um, a, a contagious sickness or disease, um, as is a plague. So this this idea is sort of repeated in both of these words. Blights with plagues, the marriage hearse. So the the curse is also a reference to sexually transmitted diseases. So there's this notion that that the um, the prostitution that's happening in London is corrupting marriages, um, and many diseases such as, as such as syphilis were very prevalent in Victorian London, um, and or sorry, pre-Victorian London, and these created. Um, illness and and often led to death um which is why there's a reference to a hearse and a hearse is a vehicle used to carry a body to a funeral and so we've got quite an quite a contrast here because marriage of course is meant to be um a time of happ happiness um a, a time where two people sort of unite themselves um together yet it's being destroyed and ruined um, by, um, by the diseases that are being spread around. So something that should be spiritually good is being turned into something that, that something evil, something that leads to, leads to a funeral. So I hope you, hope you agree that this is not a happy poem and it's not, it's almost not meant to be read for pleasure. It's meant to be read um, as a way of Blake getting across his political message about the way that the powerful are imprisoning people in this sort of hell, which is London. Um, so just a few structural points about the poem. So it's written in what's called a dramatic first person monologue. In other words, um, the uh, we hear the voice of the poet um, in the first person as he's moving through the streets of London. And the pace and the rhythm of the poem give us this sense of walking through. We have a regular unbroken A, B, A, B rhyme scheme. OK, if you look back, um, if we look at the, the third verse, cry. A. Rhymes with sigh. A. A pause. B. Rhymes with walls. B. And then we hear it, see it again. Hear, tear, curse, hearse. And that rhyme scheme is used all the way through the poem. And um, it creates, it's, it's almost as if we can't escape that rhyme scheme. And it gives us a sense of relentless, never ending oppression and misery the real misery that we feel as we read the poem. It also reflects his, his walking pace, the regular rhythm and rhyme. Um, everything fills in the poem boxed in and controlled. One of the other things, um, which I haven't put on the PowerPoint, but you will need to write down, is that the poem is almost like a square. There are four verses, each of four lines. It feels like a box. Everything is boxed in. There's no escape. So just to finish, key points about the poem. Firstly, William Blake saw the rapid urbanisation in Britain at the time as a dangerous force. He was worried about many issues in society, as we mentioned, prostitution, child labour, industrialisation, disease, um, the death of marriage. For Blake, the conditions faced by people caused them to decay, so to, to break apart, whether it was their bodies physically, um, whether it was their conscience morally, or whether it was their spirits spiritually. The poem is not meant to be fun and cheerful. It's designed to be depressing. And um, Blake saw it as society destroying the creative spirit of the citizens. I think one of the big questions to ask yourself, having read this poem, is to what extent are Blake's points 
And they're kind of what we call prophecies, predictions, too, of what the future might might um, be like. To what extent are we trapped in our society? Look at the conformity. People live in houses. They have a car. They go to work. They tend to have two children on average. Um, think of you guys going to school in your school uniforms every day, um, living according to a timetable. This routine. On the one hand, routine gives us structure. But on the other hand, does it take away our freedom? Are we living in the world that Blake described or not? OK, I'll leave you to think about that for yourself. There is no answer to that question. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Goodbye and see you for the next one.